Shakespeare in Contemporary English Studies, and I'd like to start it with actually some lines from Tagore, <laughs> if I may, because all of the participants are bilingual. And th those lines are, Tumi nobo nobo rupe esho prane, esho gondhe borone gane. Because that is how we have seen Shakespeare. Shakespeare, though uh, this year, uh, it has become, we are going to celebrate Shakespeare's day on 23rd of April. And uh, even after, 455 years of his uh, time, we are celebrating him and we're seeing that he, how valid he is still in the academia. So we want to see what are the new perspectives and function, functionalities and new ways we can study Shakespeare. And thus we have organized this event. And uh, we, as my co-moderator, I have Dr. Lisa Sharmin, who is the head of Department of English, Daffodil International University, and I'd like to uh, give the floor to her and ask her to introduce our guests. Dr. Lisa Sharmin. Dr. Lisa Sharmin, may, uh, can you hear me? Well, I guess uh, uh, Lisa Sharman, ma'am, is not somehow connected with us. So uh, I, uh, I will start with introducing. And uh, it is actually my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Masud Akhtasar, who is also my teacher. And Dr. Masud Akhtasar is a professor at the Department of English, Raj University, Bangladesh. Uh, he chaired the department from uh, 2016 to 2018. And he's also a recipient of UGC Award uh, 2011 in the category of Best Research Paper in Arts and Humanities. And Dr. Uh, Akhtar was also a Fulbright Scholar in residence during uh, 2018 to 2019. His writings appeared in journals like Spectrum Journal of Asiatic Society of Bangladesh, uh, the Raj University uh, Journal of Arts and Law, the Sri Lanka Journal of Humanities, and uh, also there are actually so many journals. <laughs> and Sir is a scholar of post-colonial literature as well, and Sir is here with us. And uh, welcome, Sir. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Bhitti, for the generous introduction. <laughs> and good to see you. Good to see you moderating this session. Uh, it's an honor to be part of it. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. So we also have uh, Professor Mashru Shohid Hussain from Jahangir University. Uh, so uh, let me just briefly introduce him. Uh, professor Mashru Shohid Hussain is a professor of English at Jahangir University. He teaches, researches, and publishes in the areas of comparative literature, post-colonialism, and critical pedagogy, cultural studies, gender studies, and also queer studies. And at this moment, sir, is working on South Asian comparative literature. It is a book on South Asian comparative literature. And also at this moment, he is working on another book length project, which is violence against men in film and literature. Uh, then uh, Sir is also working on teaching Anglophone literature of the British and Celtic uh, Isles in Bangladesh. So this is also another book length project. And Sir is actually very active virtually as well. He has his weekly webinar series and also uh, so he has convened the English uh, Jubilee Lit Fest 2021. Mashru Shohid sir, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us. Mashru, sir, can you hear us? Yes, I do. And I say thank you. Mm, you're welcome, sir. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we also have Dr. Sheikh Mehdi Hassan with us. Uh, sir, how are you? <laughs> sir, may, uh, can you hear me? So I'm going okay. to briefly introduce. Now, now I can hear you. I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce him as well. Uh, and uh, Sheikh Mehdi Hassan, uh, Dr. Sheikh Mehdi Hassan, sir, is an uh, associate professor of uh, from. Uh, Okay, what's up? Sheikh Mehdi Hassan earned his PhD in English in uh, 2013 from the English and Foreign Language University, Hyderabad, India, um, and uh, under the SARC scholarship scheme. Uh, 
for, it was uh, the duration was 2010 to 2013 and it was sponsored by the government of India and he is now currently the associate professor in the department of English language and literature ja and ja in Jatiyo Kobi no uh, Kaji Nozrul Islam University and uh, sir has um, interests in different areas like decolonization, post-colonization, and uh, he is also co-editing a peer-reviewed uh, journal titled Southeast University Journal of Arts and uh, Social Sciences. Uh, so, sir, welcome. Thank you so much. And he is also doing a lot of work, and we are going to listen to him. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So at the very beginning, uh, Mashur sir has informed me that he has some uh, constraints uh, with uh, his time because I think he has another webinar. So I'd like to invite Mashur sir and he actually has a very interesting topic for all of us. And his topic is I'll teach you differences, teaching Shakespeare differently. And he's going to focus on Shakespearean drama. So without any further ado, I'd like you to start your presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Ifti uh, Rahman and uh, Lisa Shernin, Saidi Rahman and Tissot Bidi uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and for inviting me uh, to this session. Uh, I had a different plan with the visuals, but somehow the Prezi did not work today. Uh, so what I will do today is uh, to uh, use uh, the PowerPoint at certain points of time. That is, I will use PowerPoint, but not continuously. Uh, because at some points, showing visuals uh, might be necessary for a better understanding of what I'm going to say. Uh, so I will keep talking, but sometimes I will use visuals that may uh, somehow take a little bit extra time, uh, but uh, that uh, I will do in order to uh, facilitate uh, the understanding. What we understand is that for this, it is best if we can watch the play, either live or, or maybe recorded version maybe even uh, the BBC version of Shakespearean play, if I say. Uh, but it is also important that many uh, or most of the plays, even in uh, to a certain extent Shakespeare's plays, uh, they contain uh, elements or signals of uh, the elements of theater, elements of performance. For example, when our character enters and when our character exits. So uh, this is something that I am taking up today and this is what I mean that when we teach uh, a play, any play, uh, in English studies, it must involve these three elements for a fuller understanding and updated interpretation of the play. A fuller because, uh, the, for example, the theme of Macbeth is accentuated by the darkness of its stage. Updated because our renewed knowledge about the recent stage productions of a play makes the play more relevant and our reading more nuanced. Now, if would uh, if I begin, then I'd like to begin with uh, travel to the past. And let me travel five years back. It was 2016. I was touring several European countries, and it was 2016. Uh, that is the 400-year anniversary of the legacy or the phenomenon of Shakespeare. So how could I miss watching Shakespeare live? So I opted for his birthplace, uh, Stratford Avon Avon, and I purchased two tickets of two phenomenal plays, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus and Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, mounted by RSC or Royal Shakespeare Company. Now, the reason that I'm sharing this experience is that my experience was fascinating because the Hamlet I watched was a predominantly Black Hamlet. Uh, so here I'm showing the poster of the play, and this is uh, the poster of the play, which shows Hamlet as a black character. And if you go further, uh, that is not only that it is it involves black characters, uh, but it, it it is spectacularly colorful and bright, unlike many other productions of uh, Hamlet. And it is because the play is set not in Denmark. I mean, it is nominally Denmark, but it is in West Africa. So when we say that it is a black Hamlet, it is not, it is black Hamlet uh, nominally in Denmark, but actually in West Africa. So the question is, why am, am I talking about this? 
So the director of the play, Simon Godwin, took the setting of the play to some unnamed country in West Africa. On the one hand, uh, it left the play, as I said, that breathtakingly spectacular. On the other hand, it uh, foregrounds a major theme of Hamlet, that is a clash of ideas or the clash of ideologies. Uh, we know that why Hamlet procrastinates, because there was a disorienting conflict between the medieval tradition of revenge and the modern Renaissance thinking that left Hamlet confused. Now, Simon Godwin's choice of the setting was intended to accentuate culture clash. Experienced by an intelligent student, Hamlet, who moved from Wittenberg University, Germany, to West Africa, that is moved from Europe to West Africa. West Africa, where ghosts can communicate. Now, therefore, this is a clash, we can say, between the Western style educated reasoning and the indigenous affective interpretation. So, therefore, this Hamlet senses that his educated persona, conditioned by foreign and imported education, does not fit in the indigenous form of hermeneutics. Now, this culture clash does accentuates another theme of Hamlet that we tend to overlook, and that is diaspora and the consequent experience of dislocation and outsiderness. And this is rather clearly presented in scene two, act two of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, I'm just showing the dialogue. It's Guildenstern and Hamlet. When Guildenstern said, uh, what do you call prison? So prison, my lord, Hamlet said, Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one. Then Hamlet said, yeah, world is a good prison. Now Denmark being one of the worst. We think not, uh, my lord. Then Hamlet said, well, it is everyone's individual thinking, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. So the question is, what is understandable is that Hamlet was for a long time outside, outside his own country. And when he's back, he somehow fails or it was difficult for him to fit in. Now, this diaspora consciousness is highlighted in the 2016 Hamlet that I was talking about by the very opening sin. It is a sin that was not in the original text. It is a brief sin at Wittenberg University, which shows that Hamlet is, uh, is in the graduation ceremony and he was graduated. Now, this sin uh, in, at Wittenberg University was necessary to highlight the culture clash, as very soon in the very next scene, we will see Hamlet moving to West Africa, his uh, country. So this uh, scene was necessary to highlight the culture clash. And also it suggests why Hamlet will soon find himself in an, as an outcast in his own land, land that asks for revenge. For the director, the choice of West Africa was intended to foreground Hamlet's sense of dislocation where he felt conflicted by the demands of his ancestors against the pressure to find a new way of thinking that he learned in Wittenberg. But this sense is further enhanced by the choice of the actor playing Hamlet, Papa Isidu. He's a Ghana-born English actor. Now all these uh, thus brought to the fore in the director's words, a contemporary global question. That is, where are our roots? or uh, what do our roots ask for us? So the West African student, Hamlet, is in a dilemma to negotiate between Western and African, between imported and indigenous ideologies. But he later responds affirmatively to the call of his father, to the call of the ghost. Let us recall an iconic statement made by the ghost. When the ghost leaves, every time he says, remember me. Now this remember me, assumes double significance and Hamlet is uh, present, uh, placed in West Africa. So remember me thus uh, suggests on the one hand uh, that the African ancestor is asking the best educated Hamlet not only to remember his father, but also to recall, remember the culture and healing that he hailed from. So this clash between reason and passion takes us to the third point, the ethics of violence. We know that Hamlet, with his decision to be or not to be, that is to kill or not to kill, 
makes stand before a very disturbing question. Is revenge ever necessary? Is violence an accepted means of attaining justice? Is there something called constructive violence? Violence that destroys an unjust social order in order to bring change to a society? We know uh, these questions are relevant, very, very relevant, not only in the world, but in the country that we're living in. So my contention, the point that I'm making with this short discussion is that our teaching learning of Hamlet should make reference to or should involve watching or staging new or contemporary stage productions of Hamlet. Because staging or watching the almost all black or spectacularly colorful Hamlet has more than shock effect. Due to the very new and different perspective that this Hamlet forces us to adopt, such a production of Hamlet with its black protagonist, but following the original dialogue very closely, it helps us reinterpret diaspora consciousness and acts of violence, two issues that inform our contemporary experience and that teachers and students of English studies must be willing and must be able to address. Now, this takes us to Othello. Uh, and I would like to give the subtitle to this section as O. So if Shakespeare's Hamlet is a white person, but played by a black performer in Godwin's theater, what about Othello? the black protagonist of Shakespeare's play Othello, the Moor of Venice, that was usually performed by white male actors. So we are familiar with the controversy. We know that the play and the character of Othello, a Moorish prince, has been a constant source of controversy. And the controversies rest chiefly on racism. That is the representation of a black man who rises to power, who is married to a white beauty, then who, is, who brutally kills his wife, out of a murderous frenzy of jealousy is an effective narrative to endorse the myth of black people. But this is not the point that I'm making, rather I'm making of uh, the very production or the very representation of Othello. That is how come Othello came into being? Uh, and why did Shakespeare present him this way? As we understand that for many critics, racism in Shakespeare's Othello was invoked with full authorial awareness, and it was intended to quote the audience to view Othello as brutally maniac. Now this claim may carry some authenticity because Shakespeare's Othello is based on an Italian story, <laughs> Un Captino Moro, or a Moorish captain, written by Giovanni Giraldi Cynthia. And Shakespeare's Othello, the black protagonist, is based on Otho, the protagonist of the Italian story. But critics contend that Othello appears to be more abominable than Otho. Added to this, if we think of the first performance of Othello, it was in 1604 or maybe in 1603, and it happened just two years after first Queen Elizabeth in 1602 made an edict. Through which edict, she ordered the expulsion of all the almost all the members of Negroes and Black Moors who immigrated in Britain during the English Anglo-Spanish War. So uh, the Black people were forced to leave England in 1602 and Othello appeared on stage in 1603 or maybe on 1604. So although the concept of racism was not in vogue in the Elizabethan England, Elizabeth's proclamation must have reflected or influenced people's negative attitude to and prejudice stance against the black known as Moors. It therefore makes sense to claim that Shakespeare's black hero, Othello, arguably catered to white supremacism and anti-black ethnocentrism of his contemporary audience. Again, some may question, this is a sweeping generalization. The case is not that simple. And yes, the case was not that simple because if O in Othello has something to do with Otho. O for Othello has something to do with Wahed. So the reason is that uh, two years before Elizabeth I's proclamation of the expulsion of all Blacks, an ambassador 
of the king of Burberry, now Morocco. He visited Queen Elizabeth and stayed for six months in the residency. And his name was Abdul Wahid bin Masood bin Muhammad Anon. So let me show uh, the painting of the person. Uh, uh, this is Abdul Wahid. Uh, the point is this that before the expulsion of the black people and before the appearance of Othello, a black character, black Moor on stage, the Elizabethans had exposure to this ambassador. Now, why this uh, event is important? It is important uh, because uh, on the one hand, records tell us that Shakespeare's company of theater performed before this ambassador. On the other hand, many Elizabethans were impressed by the charisma, by the dashing look of Abdul Wahid, the first black Muslims they met. So Shakespeare's black hero, Othello, may involve more than racism. He catered to rather the mystifying exoticism that many Elizabethans attached to the Moors. The third point uh, is the performance of Othello. If the characterization of Othello is fraught with problems, it's casting too. I mean, uh, was Othello performed by the black performers? On the one hand, was Othello is, yes, Othello is an Arab, but uh, was he, uh, I mean, sorry, Othello was a black, but was he an African black? an Arab black or a Spanish black. More importantly, it is interesting to notice that in most cases, uh, Othello was performed by the white performers. Uh, understandably, during the Elizabethan time, there were no black performers. So it was Richard Burbage, a white Londoner, who would play uh, uh, Othello. Later, uh, it was chiefly performed by the white performers. And there were questions. So what happens if Othello is performed by a black performer? Something that Othello being performed by a black performer can be demeaning. For example, Hugh Kershey, a British Ghanaian actor, told that Othello most definitely should not be played by a black actor. Why? Because Othello was not originally meant to be played by a black actor. Rather, Othello was conceived by a white playwright for a predominantly white audience to be performed by a white actor. So now if a black actor plays the role, does he not invoke white gaze, a white way of looking at black men as over emotional, excitable and in unstable? Very interestingly, Hugh Kershey, who objected this, he played the role of Othello in 2015. And when he was asked, uh, was he contradictory? He said that no, he said that when Othello is performed by a black performer, the focus is shifted from race onto character so that the audience does not readily connect uh, Othello the character with the black performer. So it is important to differentiate between the character and the performer. So my contention is that while studying and teaching contentious or controversial texts like Othello, we need to survey the histories, for example, histories of casting and characterization. This enlarged view will leave our take on racism and ethics more critically nuanced. Uh, now, I'm not taking the account of time. Dipti, can you tell us how much, tell me how long is left out of? Uh, we have already crossed 15 minutes, sir, but okay. please, you can go on, please. Okay, I will take then three minutes yes, uh, uh, to talk about Merchant of Venice and some points. So what I dealt with till now is that uh, when we are dealing with uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet uh, and when we are dealing with Shakespeare's Othello, on the one hand, I talked about the staging of Shakespeare's play and how we I need to be aware of different uh, adaptations, different versions of Shakespeare's play, because it will help us uh, address the more relevant, more contemporary issues more fruitfully. The second one is when we teach or study Othello, it is important that we keep into account the performance elements of the play and who would play Othello and why, and that will bring the issues of racism with all its nuances. 
I would like to close this discussion with the Merchant of Venice. And we know the find the connection. If Othello is a Moor of Venice, a black man of Venice, there is another infamous Shakespearean character who also lives in Venice, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. So we are familiar with the controversy that is Shakespeare's controversial representation of Shylock, a Jewish money lender. And uh, we also, for example, I said these questions and students answered these questions. That is, do you think that Shakespeare, sorry, Shylock is an out and out villain or is he also a victim? So we are familiar with this. What we often tend to ignore is the way. Two things. Number one is the Jewish audience. Did Shakespeare's uh, audience include any Jew? And how did they respond to this representation of Shylock? And second is, how do the contemporary Jewish audiences receive the play? So the answer to the question is that Shakespeare's Elizabethan theater did not have any, probably did not have any Jew audience. And of course, the contemporary Jewish audience's response to the play is troublesome. For this, I would like to show very briefly some information regarding uh, Shakespeare's formation of the character of Shylock. And I will, I will do it in, a, in brief. Uh, that is, what about the perceptions of Jews in England when Shakespeare staged this play? Uh, we need to remember that the Jews were expelled from England in 1290 during the reign of Edward II. And, uh, and one of the reasons, of course, there were the Crusades and the Christian, uh, Christian uh, Jew conflict. But one of the reasons that fueled this expulsion, but, uh, but the blood level, blood level was a kind of mythology, a kind of mythic fabrication that the Jews for their ritual would collect and murder Christian children. And that somehow uh, accentuated or enhanced hatred against the Jews. And also the Jews were routinely stigmatized and tortured. For example, they had to wear a certain type of cap and certain type of uh, symbol. So this is something uh, that I would like to show. So what happens is that now if this is the case, and if the case is that the Jews did not return to England before 1650, then during the Elizabeth period, uh, on the one hand, Jews were not there. And also Shakespeare was not much introduced to the Jews. So, but we can see that the representation of Shakespeare and the Elizabethan audiences approach to the Jews were problematic. Understandably, therefore, it was an ill-founded representation of Jew, and that actually caused all the controversies. Uh, so if we uh, move to the last point that I will take one minute, and that is about, uh, so how do the contemporary Jewish audiences respond to uh, the Merchant of Venice? Understandably, there were many rather serious offense against the play. Some even said that this play should not be read, rather it should be thrown into the gar into garbage, uh, while others were a little bit uh, more uh, in, uh, sympathetic. The question is then, uh, why do we in Bangladesh offer this play, for example, in the first year? And if we offer this play, how much do we uh, introduce our students to uh, the complexities of the representations, not simply anti-Semitism, but other things. So the question or the contention that I would like to bring is uh, how our literary work is received across time, across place, across cultures are conditioned by the different audiences and that different audiences change the interpretations of a text. We must not forget by the Jewish audience dislike the Merchant of Venice, the Merchant of Venice, particularly Shylock, was liked by a very famous or infamous political leader, Hitler, the fan of the Merchant of Venice. And we understand why. So my point of contention is that when we teach, read, study, and watch the Merchant of Venice in English studies in Bangladesh, we must address these issues of audiencing and audience reception as well. That will that is likely to leave us more tolerant toward the other and more accommodative. This is what I came uh, want to say: uh, teaching, reading, approaching Shakespeare differently. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much, sir. And it was a very different kind of insight, the way you have presented contextualization, different kind of adaptation, I should say, of Shakespeare and how we can respond effectively to it. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very enjoyable session. I think the guests have a lot of questions. And I have to say that all of the participants, if you have any question, you may uh, write your question in the chat box. I don't know, sir, how long you're going to be with us to address those questions. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be here until 7.30 because we have a webinar at 8. Yeah. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And now, I, actually, I'd like to invite the Vice President of Tissol Society of Bangladesh, Hamidul Haq, sir, to say a few words. I gave Mashur, sir, floor before because he has some time constraints. Sir, can you actually provide a delayed welcome note? <laughs> Hamidul Haq, sir. And good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. You're clear, loud and okay. clear. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, it's a different uh, type of session uh, to be organized by TISO Society of Bangladesh. Dipti has already mentioned uh, because uh, when we hear the terms like TISO, ELT, applied linguistics, uh, we have we certainly have uh different things in mind not literature music so let me give a, a background of Tito, Tiso society of bangladesh uh, it came into actually the discussion during 2014 actually when uh, uh, we actually have been working in a project initiated by british council and also uh, supported by university grants commission in bangladesh uh, around 26 faculty members from 13 different universities, public, private, including national universities. There are three colleges. I mean, so there were teachers from three colleges. We came together in a workshop and we stayed together, in fact, uh, uh, during the workshop. Uh, shop. So we had the opportunity to actually exchange our uh, views, interact with each other. And uh, then we felt that, that we should have some organization or platform that may cater to the needs of uh, English teachers. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see uh, in the objectives of uh, Tissot Society of Bangladesh, we explicitly expressed that we want to, we'd like to coexist with the allied disciplines, related disciplines. And we believe that English literature is a related discipline. This is a reality that most of the, ling I mean, ELT, applied linguistics, discipline, and lit English literature, they universities in Bangladesh. So why not accept this reality and also uh, literature, English literature is read, studied in schools, colleges, universities to teach English. So I th we, we thought, yeah, why not? In fact, uh, uh, we have been uh, working together for long. So uh, let us actually uh, bring all the allied and related discipline in the same platform. Yes, our focus is English language teaching applied linguistics, but we are open. Uh, Professor Masru Shahid Bhusan already mentioned about the differences. Yes, we believe uh, that yeah, we can actually uh, uh, sort of uh, open to these differences. We can look at the same thing differently. Uh, so when actually uh, Tissot Society of Organ uh, Bangladesh thought about this event, actually all well uh, this event and Shakespeare, all of us know that he is a celebrity even after four, 400 years. And uh, in, in fact, uh, many students who join uh, to study English initially, they actually uh, know about Shakespeare, not necessarily they know, know about, let's say, applied linguistics or ELT. They join English department and then they become familiar with different uh, sub disciplines. So Obviously, we live in these realities, uh, I mean, and let us accept the differences and these 
differences in our realities. Uh, and uh, even in the uh, Tissol Society of Bangladesh, we have uh, members from all the allied disciplines and related disciplines, like Dipti, I'm the, today's moderator. Uh, she is a, a, a faculty member who actually loves lit English literature and teaches English literature. And she has been working with us. And we welcome it. all, uh, what to say, the faculty members who co come and uh, what's the, who come from different disciplines. Uh, we have mentioned this in our, uh, what to say, objectives, mission, vision, objectives. Uh, we have mentioned the disciplines like even psychology, because uh, we uh, talk about uh, English language teaching and psychology is really very much related to English language teaching. Uh, we talked about, even we have mentioned about, let's say, uh, discipline like, uh, what to say, uh, literature, yes. Uh, uh, then there are different uh, disciplines from even uh, linguistics, social linguistics, psycholinguistics. The, these are very much related. Uh, and uh, we actually would like to work with these disciplines in future. And this is the beginning. That is the best thing to say. Uh, that uh, today is, uh, in fact, uh, I would say it's that's a new beginning for uh, Tissol Society of Bangladesh. Uh, though it started, the idea came into, uh, or into the discussion in 2014. In the in the last year, during uh, what is said the pandemic, actually, uh, uh, the association actually uh, finally, I mean. Uh, received government recognition. Uh, it is now a registered organization. And we want to let everybody know that uh, it's not only for the English language teachers or applied linguistics. It is open to all other allied and related discipline. Please uh, join us and reach us. And we actually openly, uh, what is a welcome all faculty members from different disciplines who are interested in linguistics, English linguistics, English literature, or in general English studies in Kiso Society of Bangladesh. With these few words, we welcome all of you in today's program. Thank you very much. Over uh, to you, Dipti. Oh, thank you so <coughs> much, Hamid, sir. And actually, we like to practice the harmonizing principle always in Tissot Society of Bangladesh, because I personally do not see any essential difference between language and literature. So, uh, Mashur, sir, you have a couple of questions. As you're going to leave very fast, uh, Rakib Shohan has asked a question. I'm going to take this time to actually ask you the question on behalf of him. Uh, let me just see. Um, so uh, the question is, would you please elaborate a bit on the ethics of violence and the presence or absence of constructive violence that you hinted in your speech in case of Hamlet? Okay, uh, of course I, I left, uh, I mean, I did not elaborate on it because it will take time. Uh, uh, on the one hand, ethics of violence is that, is does violence have any ethics? The question is, what do we mean by ethics? Uh, the contemporary conception of ethics is that it is other oriented, that ethics is not about the well-being of my, uh, my well-being, but it is about the well-being of the other. And our digression, but very relevant, is that corona pandemic somehow uh, pushes us or pushed us to this text and is concerned for the other. So if ethics is other centric or other oriented, then the violence of ethics involves that uh, when I, when do I need to use violence or do a uh, can I ever justify the use of violence, use of uh, uh, revenge in order to attain justice? This is something that uh, Hamlet takes us into. Now, what we know as constructive violence or transformative violence is that uh, on the one hand, violence can be constructive. This is dangerous discussion, but again, violence can be constructive if it destroys uh, the destroyer, if it destroys the unjust social order, unjust system, and unjust people in order to liberate the people towards or for a better affirmative world. But violence can also be constructive and transformative if it helps a person to construct its identity. Uh, giving a very short but dangerous example is that if a slave kills his master, then this killing can be considered as uh, transformative. 
because a slave who never takes any decision in his life rather follows orders now this killing of a master is the first time that he or she takes the agency takes the decision to kill now hamlet uh, can be crucial i mean when hamlet becomes black and it, therefore it takes us or foregrounds the conflict or clash between east and west between white and black something that is not evident in shakespeare's hamlet so what i said is that this uh, 2016 hamlet now brings uh, or brought some issues into focus that we need to address in a world where we have to address this problem that can be uh, endorsed violence even when it is meant to change the world for better so there is no final answer to this necessarily uh, but uh, this renewed hamlet or re uh, or differently viewed hamlet uh, helps us or the students or teachers or readers to revivify or read read uh, these issues uh, in a different way that is opening up the issue Oh, thank you so much, sir, for the elaboration. I hope Rakesh Shohan, you have received your answer. He actually has a couple of more questions, but at this moment, sir, we need to move on. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, at the end of the uh, webinar, maybe towards the end, Rakesh Shohan, we can uh, discuss more. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm really glad to inform everyone that my co-moderator, Dr. Lisa Sharmin, has joined, and I'd like to hand the mic over to her now. Lisa Sharmin, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much, Dipti. Um, now, uh, after the uh, uh, session, uh, wonderfully thought-provoking uh, session of Professor Mashur Shahid Hussain, we would like to march towards um, our uh, Dr. Sheikh Mehdi Hassan. Um, uh, let me tell a little bit about uh, him, as I was supposed to start it much earlier, Due to my technical some technical glitches, I couldn't be connected. Um, uh, some uh, more information about uh, Dr. Mehdi Hassan. Uh, Dr. Mehdi earned his PhD in English literature in 2013 from the English and Foreign Language University, Hyderabad, India, under Sir Scholarship Scheme 2010 to 2013, sponsored by the Government of India. He is currently Associate Professor in Department of English Language and Literature, Jatiyo Kobi Kaji Nosrul Islam University, JKKNIU, Trishal Maimen Singh, Bangladesh. His research interests include, among others, South Asian writing in English, post-colonialism, cultural studies, and globalization studies. He is editor of Dialogics, a uh, research journal of department and of his department and executive editor of the research journal of humanities published by the faculty of arts uh, jkkniu he is the co-editor of the journal titled southeast university journal of arts and social sciences 2014 he has published and presented research articles widely in national and international journals and international seminar and conference. We would like to march towards him to listen on decanonizing, isn't decolonizing, reading Shakespeare in local context. Maybe, sir, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lisa Sharmin. Uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, yes, my topic is uh, decolonizing isn't decolonizing, reading Shakespeare in local contexts. And uh, I'm speaking from a local context, from a university in Trishal, Myron Singh, though the concept of university is a global phenomenon. And the virtual medium or platform we are using to be linked to each other from different corners of the world marks the fluid nature of a space and, of course, dismisses the local global debate. <clears throat> anyway, I would like to convey my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Tissol Bidi, the organizer of today's webinar, and welcome the respected audience to my discussion. And really, I uh, feel honored to be invited by Tissol BD 
and uh, actually this program is a great one as uh, two great scholars and professors have joined the program and we listened to Professor Mashu uh, uh nice discussion on, on uh, the adaptation of Shakespeare. Okay, so let us begin what I have, I, uh, I'd like to say, uh, aware of the fact that uh, canonizing literary texts was never an innocent process, I speak against decanonizing Shakespeare and argue that only decanonizing will not lead to decolonizing, implying the fact that facing the problems is always rewarding than quitting them. In the beginning, let me mention two incidents that took place in my department, that means Department of English Language and Literature, uh, Jati Yoko Bikazi Nozrul Islam University. On is the celebration of Shakespeare's birth anniversary, uh, which was titled Shakespeare Everywhere, organized by my department in 2016, where Shakespeare was grandly, colorfully, locally, indigenously, and intellectually presented. Another one was not an event in that sense, but rather an observation given by my academic peers. The main argument centered around whether in MS syllabus, a core course titled Shakespeare Studies should be kept. The question was, would studying tragedies and comedies of Shakespeare be relevant since many new areas of interdisciplinary studies emerged in the field and an arts of decentralization and decanonization was felt. Both the pro-Shakespearean and anti-Shakespearean had sound arguments and the debate was completely academic and constructive. Then the uh, old course was replaced by a, a new course titled Contemporary Readings of Shakespeare. But interestingly, in that course, Shakespeare is mainly read through Eurocentric literary theories, such as structuralism, feminism, Marxism, postmodernism, and so on. Uh, my intention to mention these incidents is that where there is Shakespeare, there are contradictions and controversies. Shakespearean studies is never without debate, and uh, that is never innocent, you should say, but political, of course, the most political among the canons. Now let us concentrate on the central themes of my topic, that is decanonizing, decolonizing, and localizing. And while referring to these phrases, we must revisit why, when, and how Shakespeare was introduced in the subcontinent during British colonization. Uh, we also need to think about whether Shakespeare was introduced as just a great poet and playwright or a canonical institution, strong pillars of colonial culture and sense and sensibility. In fact, Shakespeare entered our context politically at crucial historical moments. Therefore, it's not surprising that some post-colonial scholars in the name of promoting world literature or uh, literature in English translation or local literature tend to dismiss English literature as colonial literature as well as the writers of colonial origins uh, who of course contributed significantly to the ideological and cultural grounds of colonial. That is the reason they speak for decanonizing, thinking that decanonizing means de decolonizing. Now, uh, one question uh, may be raised. Then if we don't uh, de decanonize Shakespeare, then for what reasons should we read Shakespeare? What would be the reasons? There are many reasons, and all the reasons are well known to us. but. Uh, just uh, I'm trying to sum up. Is it uh, for originality or authenticity that we should read Shakespeare? Uh, Puritans and conformists would say yes, but can anyone prove that all the texts we read and recite on this page 
were originally written by Shakespeare. Then they went through many phases of revisions and editions or editing by many editors and uh, Shakespeare experts. So if you look at the history, this, this question will, will get very clear answer to these questions and many experts and researchers also did, uh, uh, did uh, research on, on, on this area. Besides, what about the stories and uh, folk tales or folklore that Shakespeare adapted and used in uh, composing his plays? So for originality and authenticity is uh, an extremely debatable issue. And Shakespeare's study cannot be justified in the name of originality and authenticity. Then come to another point that is for humanism or importance of human agency that you can find in Shakespeare's place. Okay, uh, are all the humans equal in Shakespearean world? Already we, we listened to Professor Masu Shahid. Uh, uh, what about the Jews, the Arabs, the Moors, the Africans, overall the Oriental? So uh, aren't some humans more equal in Shakespearean world, in Shakespearean place? So then this ground uh, can also be debated. And then if we think about the themes that are considered universal themes, but universal themes are universally universal, that can be found in any corner of the globe. So uh, how a theme can be universal? This, this is something that we need to ponder over. And then another point that may come if we consider the introduction of Shakespeare in the subcontinent, that is pedagogical implications regarding language learning. But can the texts be taught as you don't write like Shakespeare? We don't write like Shakespeare. So don't you think about the way language was written in Elizabethan era, or the original quote unquote Shakespearean text. So we, we, we need to think about that also. And yes, uh, most of the plays, even all the plays uh, uh, have been abridged and adapted and uh, you know used uh, for teaching purposes at different institutions. And the famous one, we, all, we know that the author of that, William Lamb, but that was also Victorian adaptation. And there are many other adaptations used at English medium schools, in, even in Bangladesh. But what about our writers? What about our experts and Shakespeare scholars? So where uh, his texts or the stories uh, put in local context, I mean, uh, some sort of adaptation that will you know, be consistent with uh, is there any problem? Uh, I request everyone to keep their microphones uh, mute, please. While okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that, I think there's a sort of noise. Okay, anyway, so we can uh, we can locally adapt. So that can be that can be another point that his texts can be adapted. The stories uh, can be adapted in local contours, and that can be used for teaching language. And uh, if we now just uh, argue that, then why Shakespeare? Then uh, we, we can say that Shakespeare should not uh, be you know, read just for humanism or uh, nor he should be read as, as uh, uh, for, for universalism, but he can be read for humanism because the idea of human, human is older than Shakespeare and has been used, appropriated politicized, monopolized, and at times abused. So a sort of you know, comparative framework we should keep in mind while studying Shakespeare. And if, if uh, I mention, we know that, that up to now, Shakespeare is always discussed in a sort of global context. So you can say that Shakespeare has been globalized and that is enough. I mean, anything, and everything can be Shakespeareized. So it's time to localize, localize Shakespeare. And if we just, as, as we are you know, attending this conference arranged by Tissol BD, of which uh, the, this organization 
is more involved in language teaching and also involved in you know adapting and uh, experimenting different uh, types of uh, and methods of language teaching so that we can think about like uh, now english the english that we teach that we learn that we speak or that you write is not a national language of you know the english or it's not someone's father tongue but it's a global language now and it, and it is owned by anyone who speaks or writes in the language so in that sense any english author can be owned by anyone having literary sense having a literary bent of mind a part of the person who knows how to appreciate how to interpret it so in that sense uh, we can adapt we can localize shakespeare and new text uh, new you know stories can be written in our context and those uh, texts having that universal message of the sense of humanity can be used in classrooms and this way shakespeare uh, can be put into local context but one thing that uh, may come to your mind that is uh, what will the center you know the center i mean uh, that uh, <clears throat> center of the empire whatever you say so how will they react uh, will the center allow that to happen uh, once we know that once uh, something or someone is canonized and made sacred can that or that person be decanonized so what we can do we can let them think and decide and in the meantime let us localize and contextualize shakespeare but obviously not by distorting his creations but by rereading reinterpreting and reinventing thank you all and that's all for today thanks many thanks <coughs>
professor hamidul haq uh, bikti rehman uh, and uh, other colleagues uh, at tesel uh, society of bangladesh for organizing uh, this seminar uh, and also co speakers professor marshu shahid hussain i am not sure whether he is still present and dr sheikh behdi hassan and uh, all of you who have cared to join the program this evening i hope the audience is not uh, already tired uh, after a uh, couple of i mean uh, presentations uh, let me begin with the note uh, that despite the enormous heap of scholarship on shakespeare piled up over the years in different corners of uh, the global academia every involvement of ours with shakespearean opera gives birth to a new shakespeare and through these reincarn reincarnations or revisions shakespeare transcends the limits of individual subjectivity and becomes a metaphor my topic for now is part of evon and uh, bombay cinema that means i shall speak uh, on the nuances of relationship between bollywood and shakespeare very briefly of course as uh, we do not have scopes here for a comprehensive survey of the films that have borrowed themes and storylines from the bard the abundant world of shakespeare seems to have always fascinated uh, bollywood filmmakers in inspiring them to interpret or adapt his texts in the context of their own socio cultural milieu the bard of avon began to appear on the big screen of bombay several decades ago and now bollywood has Uh, domesticated his tales of love revenge intrigue and violence popularizing them with its own masala formula the inclusion of dance music item numbers and so on to entertain and cater to the taste and interest of the see audience filmmakers have translated the bard's works in their own tongues and tones and it is interesting to see how bollywood has remained a fertile field for shakespearean texts to be re-explored reinterpreted or reinvented In this connection, it is also important to understand the politics of appropriating and commoditizing literary and cultural artifacts for mass consumption. Over the years, a huge academic industry, as well as a consumerist cultural market, has grown around this universally acknowledged literary icon. The relationship between Bollywood and Shakespeare might have been cemented upon the industry's fascination and admiration for the works of the bard. but at the same time there runs a very palpable economic interest that points finger at the essentially commercial nature of bollywood's engagements with this uh, literary and cultural phenomenon called shakespeare as pratibha chakraborty says in her paper on rithiporno ghosh uh, the last year shakespeare represents quote and quote international cultural capital as well as universal values which has turned him not only a cultural asset but also an economic one on the other hand with the advent of globalization with and with india emerging as a rather strong economy bollywood has turned from an indigenous product into a global brand exerting influence on the international culture industry thus as pratibha says the combination of bard of avon and bombay uh, this seemingly incongruous nexus uh, between shakespeare the highbrow elite and bollywood the lowbrow the popular does appear somehow natural and happens to constitute a cultural capital and together they have become a signifier of a new global culture although the politics of adaptation and appropriation is significantly shaped by commercial uh, purposes as we have discussed the relationship between bollywood and shakespeare nevertheless opens up windows to conversations between divergent cultures and communities transcending the confines of binaries of the high versus low elite subaltern east to west and so on shakespearean texts the shakespearean texts inherent modernity and contemporaneity allow the bard to speak to states unborn and accents yet unknown to quote from his julius caesar doing bollywood shakespeare made us yield fresh meanings and avenues of looking at texts and may fruitfully constitute a larger framework of reading multiple possible shakespeares involving an essentially interdisciplinary 
critical exercise. In post-independent India, filmmakers' adaptation and appropriation has significantly influenced the cinematic trajectory of Bollywood. India's premier film industry in Mumbai, which is identified by Ashish Nandi as popular mass culture, while for Bija Misra, pan-Indian popular culture. Now, the acceptance of Bollywood as a global phenomenon and a cultural industry has precipitated new interests in Indian Shakespeare. And Shakespeare in film has emerged as one of the vast growing branches of Shakespeare studies in recent years. The Indian cinema itself in the early phases of its inception was strongly influenced by the Parsi theater, which not only incorporated melodramatic blocks, elements of violence from the works of Shakespeare into multilingual indigenous stories. Once in an interview, Nas Nasiruddin Shah, a veteran Bollywood actor who has appeared on stage as well as on screen, playing the leading roles of Shakespeare's plays, remarked, I quote, the roots may look lost. Uh, he, of course, I mean, uh, mentions the Parsi theater, but every big story in the Hindi film industry is from Shakespeare, unquote. Although it may seem to be an oversimplification of Bollywood's sources, Shah's comment not only sheds light on the uh, linkages between the Bard and the Bollywood, emphasizing on the industry's dependence upon these uh, great playwrights' themes and storylines, but also generally hints at the gen general uh, relationship between film and drama, as well as the issue of the uh, film adaptation of literature. M. Asaduddin and Anuradha Ghosh, in their book uh, titled Filming Kitchen, Tagore, Premchand, and Roy, points out that the history of cinema has paralleled the history of film adaptations. Cinema as an art form has developed considerably due to its close ties to literature. And Bollywood cinema specifically seemed never hesitant to borrow and adapt from European dramas as well as novels. Adaptation or cinematic translation of literature, however, raises the issue of authenticity and the very limited relationship between film and literature. According to some writers, cinemas share a kind of parasitical relationship with literature. D.H. Lawrence, for example, uh, considers cinema as a vulgar medium, uh, while Virginia Woolf affirms the profound and intense power of figure of speech and the uniqueness of literary expression over the limited canvas and objective of cinema. No doubt, Lawrence and Woolf's observations seem to specifically revolve around the relationship between film and fiction and provide a perspective that underscores a sort of supremacy of literature over film. However, the relationship between drama and film is more immediate and direct, more uh, interactive and reciprocative. Both of these are finally performative mediums and the agencies and devices which are applied in their production also carry some shared features. Now, those who are acquainted with the auteur theory, A-U-T-E-U-R, auteur theory that foregrounds directorial intervention and authorship, authorship does not regard adaptations as passive imitation. Rather, it is viewed as an uh, essentially dynamic enterprise where questions of creativity and cultural negotiations or representations are at play. The authorists claim that cinema is literature's uh, artistic equivalence, and they distinguish authors from general adapters, adapters, and challenging the limits of uh, moralistic criticism of fidelity and validating the significance of uh, the creative transgressions in the filmic adaptations of literary texts. Thus, filmmakers, uh, even if they borrow from divergent sources, may end up writing their own individual texts too. Each and every act of adapt adaptation that becomes an act of interpretation. Uh, and interpretation, uh, to use Edward Said's insights uh, from his cultural imperialism, is very much a quote unquote worldly phenomenon, meaning that uh, it exists in a particular historical moment and originates from a specific geo uh, geocultural or political setting and can vary from age to age. Uh, from individual to individual. 
while adapting or appropriating uh, the filmmaker or director tries to negotiate with cult different cultural contexts and values uh, with different historical moments. <clears throat> now, Bollywood filmmakers uh, seem to have been particularly intrigued by the Shakespearean tragedy and romance, by the way uh, the part reflected upon human predicament, the contentious nature of human subjectivity, and the existential crisis uh, many of his protagonists suffer from. The world of his historical or political plays, and uh, even apparently apolitical ones, are revolving of the dark contemporary turmoils that dramatize the dethronement of uh, kings and princes and the unbridled desire for power and authority. Bollywood cinema has assimilated and indigenized these and many other uh, Shakespearean conceits and motives into a uh, popular Bollywood idiom. The cinema seems to be replete with indirect or subtle references to popular dialogues or characters of the bard. And it is clearly evident that the industry has uh, an incorrigible uh, fascination for Shakespearean themes and devices. The theme of duplicity and mistaken identity, the story of cross-cultural romance embodied uh, through uh, the notion of star-crossed lovers or the themes of friendship, betrayal, uh, and revenge. The first um, and uh, the pre-colonial uh, Shakespearean uh, sound film adaptation on the Hindi film screen was Khun Ka Khun in 1935, also called Hamlet, directed by Sohra Modi, who is credited as the man who brought Shakespeare uh, to the Indian cinema. Uh, it is regarded as one of the earliest talky versions of, the revenge, of this revenge tragedy. Uh, though the film failed to fare well at the box office, it garnered positive reviews, mainly for the uh, dialogues and uh, quality of the play. The 1982 film, uh, Gujar's Angur, and uh, adapt an adaptation of uh, the Comedy of Errors was a big hit at the box office and is cited by the film uh, critics as one of the successful and remarkable uh, remakes of the dramatist's plays. In contemporary India, filmmakers such as Sanjay Lila Bansali, Habib Faisal, Vishal Bhardwaj, have offered localized and indigenized versions of Shakespeare's uh, plays by addressing the present day issues of the conflicts within or among the among clans and classes. The concept of honor, honor killing, also uh, known as tap killing in Hindi, gender disparity, as well as the issue of political feuds among rival parties or groups. Bansali's Ram Lila, uh, which was I mean released in 2013, and Faisal's Ishak Jade in 2012 are the Desi adaptations of the parts romantic tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, both of which set the uh, love stories against the backdrop of political disputes between two rival uh, families or clans. These two films mirror the conflict-ridden scenario of the hinterlands of post-colonial India, characterized by uh, tensions or instances of violent, uh, violent intercaste or interreligious clashes. Though the uh, tradition of borrowing is more than a century old, the first Bollywood acknowledged adaptations of Shakespearean dramas are Bhartwa's uh, films, Mokbul in 2003, a remake of Macbeth, uh, Omkara uh, in 2006, an adaptation of Othello, uh, Haider uh, in uh, 2014, a modernized equivalent of Hamlet. Bhartwa's uh, famous for his Shakespearean uh, uh, tragic trilogy, has introduced uh, the audience to the myriad and diverse avatars of the bar, appearing uh, on screen with alternative uh, interpretations as well as contemporary versions uh, of his plays. The latest of the trilogy, Haider, Haider, brings to the fore an empathic portrayal of human uh, condition against the backdrop of the in insurgency hit uh, Kashmir conflicts of 1995. The hero Haider, uh, a Bollywoodized version of Hamlet he is a young student and a poet. He returns to Kashmir from Aligarh uh, at a very crucial juncture of the ongoing conflict and embarks on the journey of solving the mystery of his father's disappearance, but ends up being entangled in the essentially duplicitous politics uh, of the state. Bhartwa adopts the theme of intikam, 
the Urdu word for revenge. And deviating from the source text, he provides an alternative interpretation to the revenge narrative by making his protagonist forgive his father's murder. Heather, deeply influenced by his mother's dying comments, decides against taking revenge for his uh, father's death by his uncle and refuses to participate in the visa cycle of revenge or intekam, who is the protagonist's mother believes will fail to bring freedom or ajadi, not only for Heather, uh, but also for the people of Kashmir. Remember Heather's mother's uh, remarks in the movie uh, before she kills herself. I quote, intekam will give birth to more intekams. And until we do not free or azad our souls from intekam, no freedom or azadi can bring us the kind of azadi we aspire for. Uh, so the Bollywoodized versions of Shakespeare, I'm nearing the end, no worries. Uh, the Bollywoodized versions of uh, Shakespeare have not uh, only uh, come up with unique and meaningful articulations of a specific uh, or diverse cultural consciousness, but um, uh, they have also paved passages for imagination, creation, and celebration of alternatives. The film Heather redefines the concept of revenge by offering an alternative paradigm of forgiveness and also traces the roots of human tragedy in the negative emotion of revenge. Again, addressing an immensely significant and sensitive issue in the subcontinental history, the film seems to suggest that the greatest battle of humankind lies in, the liber lies in liberating themselves from the manacles of the destructive and debilitating emotions of revenge. Heather's epiphanic decision to opt out from translating the energies of revenge is a telling gesture that prioritizes the transformative potentials of forgiveness over conflict and violence. While Bollywood adaptations of Shakespeare on the one hand bring to fore uh, the fact that diverse version, versions of a text can exist simultaneously, on the other hand, they raise paraliteral issues such as the issues of commoditizing cultural artifacts for popular entertainment and mass consumption. Desi girls wearing chiffon saris and dancing amid uh, rural or urban police corps in a local bar. Uh, you, you, you can, I mean, uh, you know uh, which movie I refer to and dance performances of promising lovers in an idyllic, idyllic setting and so on are obviously I mean, potent with crowd pooling abilities. We understand that all these originate from market driven anxiety. However, the mindless objectification of women as fetish of male desire as source of voyeuristic pleasure is deeply disturbing. One cannot afford to uh, remain mindless spectator and consumer of these, rather one requires to be aware of the polit politics and politics associated with film production and reception. And needless to say, this critical awareness should be applied to when we look at Shakespeare in Bollywood. On a positive note, for Bollywood filmmakers, the task of translating Shakespeare into the cultural milieu of India proves to be, proves to be a less daunting and less challenging act. As Shakespeare's texts explore varied range of human psyche and emotions, they refuse to remain confined within a specific time and place. And they also traverse uh, different cultural categories such as high, low, popular, or mass culture and reflect local as well as wider concerns. It is thus possible to have myriad reincarnations of Shakespeare's plays uh, due to their inherent inclusivity, locality, and modernity. And perhaps we should not forget that uh, translations or adaptations from one culture to another always exist as a viable possibility uh, because cultures are ultimately uh, cultures are ultimately more similar than different. I think I should stop here, but before I end, uh, may I raise the point uh, that perhaps that uh, perhaps we should not only talk about how Bombay cinema has dealt with the Bard of Atom, but also about how Bollywood industry itself nowadays embodies atmosphere of a Shakespearean tragedy. I mean, becomes a Shakespearean tragedy itself. How its better attempts are being increasingly plagued 
by its own opportunism and compromise with the status quo, commercialization and uh, consumerism, and also by threats from different insular and extremist, extremist forces, or by the harms caused by the Iagos of Othello. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for, uh, for your, for your passions. <laughs> sir, thank you for uh, letting us visit a different landscape, a different canvas itself. Uh, sir, I have to communicate one question from Mamun sir to you. I'll go to Deepthi, but before that, let me ask one question from Mamun sir to you. The question is, uh, does it really transcend the binary? Is Ashish Nandi being a Marxist already caught in the binaries or is he a redempt Marxist? Thank you, sir, Mamu, sir, for, uh, for your interest and for joining the uh, session and listening, care, caring to listen uh, to the speech. Uh, and your uh, question is very much relevant, but my uh, Yes, I mean, the simple answer is it, uh, it, it is not able to transcend the binary. Uh, I mean, the binary you are talking about. But I was making actually a different point that how uh, Shakespeare is open to, I mean, uh, all, uh, all categories. I mean, all, uh, uh, meaning uh, how uh, it uh, accommodates, how Shakespearean plays, I mean, entire Shakespearean opera, accommodate, uh, I mean, things um, uh, accommodate things which can be, I mean, considered, uh, which, uh, which can be considered high or low or belong to the categories, I mean, uh, uh, categories of those. So uh, I was actually, uh, in, 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 in one sense, I mean, Shakespeare was initially, uh, uh, initially is a part of, I mean, popular culture, because uh, you, you, you are, uh, we are uh, still to have uh, uh, the written narrative of, I mean, uh, Shakespearean uh, plays. It was, I mean, about the theater tradition, about the st staging. It was a kind of, I mean, performance, uh, performative arts. So it was about, perhaps Shakespeare emerged as, I mean, part of popular or uh, mass culture, I mean, from, uh, from the uh, I mean, very beginning. Then, of course, I mean, it traverses, I mean, it becomes part of, uh, I mean, uh, part of uh, what uh, we understand as, uh, or what is referred to as uh, high culture. It becomes a, a part of serious, I mean, uh, academic uh, engagement. So Shakespeare, I mean, our, uh, our engagement with uh, Shakespeare or Shakespeare, the, I mean, cultural, literary and cultural phenomenon actually traverses different cultural categories. That is what I was talking about. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And now, actually, we're going to have our question and answer session. So even if the participants want to unmute themselves and ask questions one by one, then... May, 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 may I intervene if you yes, allow me? Yes, of course. Me. Of course, sir. Actually, I had another program to join at A, but okay, uh, I did not even intervene in the middle because another speaker uh, already began speaking. So I could <laughs> not have the opportunity to tell you. I'm oh, sorry for okay. that. But no, it's all right. Do you yeah. have to leave, sir? I, 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 I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm still here for five, uh, for a few minutes, or few minutes. Okay. Yes. So as uh, Master Doctor Sir is going to be here for a few more minutes, if you have any questions to Sir, you may unmute your mic and ask him directly. Uh, Rakib Shohan, you wanted to ask a question. Why don't you unmute your mic? Okay, Sir. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation here. Uh, am, am I audible? Dipti, ma'am? Yes, completely. Okay. Sir, uh, my question uh, is, uh, would you like, would you please elaborate a bit on the uh, dichotomy uh, that you mentioned forwarded by Lawrence and Wolf uh, in relation to the McLuhan's media determinism uh, where he actually hopes for a better future uh, uh, because of our altered, uh, altered sense ratio. So, uh, what is your take on this? I, I think I, I, I got your question. I got your point. Yes, I mentioned uh, uh, I mentioned Gage Lawrence and uh, Virginia Woolf. Yes. But uh, yes. the context was the relationship between film and fiction, yes. film and drama, or film and uh, literature. Right. Yeah. So it was about adaptation and appropriation of, of uh, the relationship between uh, 
I mean, D. H. Lawrence and uh, the discussion on D. H. Lawrence and uh, Virginia Woolf is relevant in our context uh, uh, with regard to the relationship between film and fiction, to be specific, right? So they believe in the superiority of literature over over film. And I, as I have mentioned, Lawrence has I mean uh, uh, called uh, cinema uh, a vulgar medium, and uh, Virginia Woolf uh, pra praised the uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, the figure of his speech, the, the use of his special vocabulary, I mean, literature's special vocabulary. And uh, of course, I mean, as a uh, uh, vehicle of uh, human expression, they, in their, uh, I mean, literature in their eyes is far and more, I mean, better. I mean, they, they, they have actually made an externalization or hierarchization between film and fiction. But uh, I, uh, but you know, the, and as I have discussed, the relationship between uh, uh, film and fiction has a fairly long history. And I also pointed out that uh, uh, you, may, you may, I mean, raise more debates uh, uh, about, uh, about adaptation of fiction, a fictional piece into a film. But the, I mean, points of, uh, uh, I mean, contentions uh, are, uh, I mean, relatively lesser uh, when you talk about the relationship between film and, dra film and drama, because they share more or less, I mean, uh, similar, similar features. So that was my point, And that was the dialectics you were referring to. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. And Rakib Shahan, thank you. And it's Deepti Apu always. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, and another thing I would like to mention that Abdullah Al Mamun sir has joined, and we are really honored that sir has joined. Sir, uh, we would like to see you. <laughs> if you uh, please turn on your camera. Yes, uh, I am. If you really want to sir, see my <laughs> old face, yes. Sir, welcome. Old haggard face, yes. yes. Glad to see and, you, sir. Uh, I, I, want, I want to take this opportunity to thank. Uh, all the three speakers uh, who are uh, uh, wonderful speakers and who presented their papers in in, a, in wonderful ways, uh, especially uh, Mashur Mehedi. Uh, Masood is very is my colleague here. We work together, so uh, the praise will be, <laughs> will will be reserved to okay, when we'll meet. I'll meet him personally. I will uh, talk to him about these things. But especially, I really want to thank uh, Mashur and Mehedi. Um, uh, for their wonderful presentations. But uh, one, uh, I have certain questions, certain issues, uh, which I actually want to uh, talk to Masood and we want to discuss this uh, when we'll be uh, sitting together and having our coffee or tea, whatever. Okay, but one thing is this, that, this, uh, that um, uh, I think that uh, I want to ask to all of you three, is this, this, this the Shakespeare, how much of Shakespeare is that because of Shakespeare as a because of his intrinsic value, and how much of Shakespeare because of his this that Shakespeare as is as a product of this you know manipulation of things that means you know that manipulation of uh, you know the fame of a, of a particular writer as a writer as um, you know as the way uh, uh, Andre Bivia uh, talks about in his. Uh, uh, you know, translation, writing, and the manipulation of fame and things like that. So uh, Shakespeare uh, in the Bombay film, uh, it's more, more or less using Shakespeare as a commodity. Uh, I, I expected that you would also focus on, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood film, that means Bangla cinema in Bangladesh. Uh, it's already a dead sort of, it, it's already dead. Why this happens, and uh, you know uh, this relation between um, you know Shakespeare, using Shakespeare in in a situation like Hindi the Bombay cinema industry and in uh, Dollywood cinema industry, uh, it's it's a question to or it's a kind of question a query to Masood. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, and another thing I'd like to mention that uh, Shakespeare is such a vast topic. We cannot cover everything in a day. So we are actually planning to no, turn this I, into but, a series. I want to very briefly respond to yes. I mean, Sarah's question. This is a very important, this is a very important issue that he raises. Uh, of course, I mean, that is generally true uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, to 
maybe I mean every uh, great author uh, that a author is uh, not only I mean a subjectivity but he is construction of the uh, construction by the people. So this is also true in the case of I mean Shakespeare, that he is um, he is a a, a person, uh, but at the same time he is a, 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 sees a construction uh, by uh, the people from uh, diverse cultures and continents. So a, a Shakespeare, as well as I mean, they are I mean, uh, this is a very important point that they are I mean construction. We we make them. And uh, about uh, other about the other other point that Sar has made that uh, why I am uh, engaging uh, with I mean uh, Bollywood, uh, but uh, I, this uh, my simple answer is that this is for this uh, this specifically for this paper. In another paper, I will do another thing, and what Sar has uh, perhaps uh, what Sar has proposed, I'll deal with uh, that uh, those things in another paper. So thank you so much, sir. And maybe, sir, actually, Mamun, sir, address the question to all three speakers. So we would also like to hear from you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm really uh, I'm really happy to hear Mamun, sir. And uh, I would like to thank him that he listened to our discussion and he made his valuable comments and a very good observations. Yes, uh, we were, I mean, the tone was almost the same. I mean, the three speakers spoke uh, almost with the same tone. That is, uh, Shakespeare was invented, you know, more invented uh, by several sections uh, of people concerned. And, uh, you know, if you put history and if we think historically, then obviously, we, we, we have to consider Shakespeare and uh, interpret Shakespeare with uh, that sense of history, I mean, that colonial history that we experienced in this uh, subcontinent. And uh, was Shakespeare introduced or was, was Shakespeare brought to this continent if it was not colonized by the British? So uh, if, if I ask this question, I mean, that would be a difficult one to answer. And uh, that is the thing. Another thing is that, you know, commercialization will be there. Always it's there. Uh, film adaptation of Shakespeare in India or in uh, Hollywood even. So it has commercial, uh, mm -hmm. commercial purposes. They, they have that. And, uh, but uh, in our local, my, my focus was on uh, our local context. I mean, especially in Bangladeshi context. So how far? have we you know reinvented or uh, you know uh, remapped shakespeare and shakespearean studies so that was my concern and i i just wanted to you know uh, my presentation was very short i just wanted to uh, uh, what should i say i just wanted to bring about uh, some issues uh, some relevant issues so that our intellectuals the experts the shakespearean experts and the scholars who think about those issues seriously and would do something in our context. So that was my concern. And obviously, I mentioned already in my paper that uh, uh, when we uh, you know, deal with Shakespeare, we must be conscious. I mean, we should read Shakespeare consciously with that, uh, you know, sort, a certain consciousness should be there, uh, you know, keeping the historical facts in mind and uh, those issues of, uh, of commercialization and those commodity values uh, should be there uh, in 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 in, uh, in our mind, and in that way, our study, our Shakespearean study, would be uh, a nuanced one, and would be you know really uh, really uh, helpful you know to to uh, to our academia. So that's all. I I, I think Mounser uh, he expressed his concern and he. Uh, you know, uh, gave his observations, and uh, we we agree with him. And and thank you, thank you, uh, thank thanks to all. Okay, thank you so much. Actually, this is going to be a never-ending debate yeah. <laughs> because the topic is so interesting, and we plan to actually arrange series of webinars. And uh, maybe next time we will have Mamun sir as a guest.
and we can have discussions. So we are really excited about the opportunity. And I would like to actually invite the General Secretary of the Society of Bangladesh at this moment to convey her, vo convey her vote of thanks because we are almost running out of time. Uh, Farzana Hafsapu, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so let us welcome the General Secretary of the Society of Bangladesh, Farzana Hafsa, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Siddha Prasanna Sultana. Uh, I'm the General Secretary of TESOL Society of Bangladesh and an Assistant Professor at the Department of English and Humanities at ULAB. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, our honorable guests uh, for their fascinating talks. Um, thank you very much, Professor Mashur Shahid Hussain, uh, Dr. Sheikh Mahidi Hassan, and Dr. Masood Akhtar. It was our honor to have you three among us um, as our guests. And I hope this collaboration will continue and uh, we look forward to more talks by you organized by the Society of Bangladesh. Um, now I would like to uh, thank the ses session moderators, uh, Dr. Aliza Sharmin and Ms. Dipti Rahman, um, and es uh, especially Dipti Rahman for coordinating the entire event. Uh, thanks a lot to the banner designer, Anika uh, Tasneem from IML, um, Dhaka University. Many thanks to Akibur Rahman Khan for his uh, technical supports and promotion. Lastly, I would like to thank Dr. Saidur Rahman, uh, the president of the Soul Society of Bangladesh um, and Mr. Hamidul Haq for all their supports. My heartfelt thanks to all the participants um, of today's event uh, for making the session an interesting and lively one. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. And I hope to see you all in our next event. Okay, thank you so much. And, event. Yes. So we, and thank you for making such a this event such a lively one. And we're not going to make a delay anymore. So thank you. It was a wonderful session. Thanks. Um.